Hello, the world. This is They Will Kill, a true crime podcast. I am Courtney Eck. And I'm Sadie Eck. And it's Sadie's night, and it's 2-22-22, so that means it's going to be such a good presentation because this night is full of magic. The portal is open. It's about to close. Won't open again for 900 years or something. I know. We better hurry up. Quick. I know. Let's get it out. Do not fuck this up. (laughs) (laughs) Too late, dude. Too late. (laughs) Do Do it for the portal. What do you got for us? Tonight, I'm going to tell you the story of the teacup killer, Graham Young. During the summer of 1961, a strange illness was slowly spreading through a northern suburb in London, England. At first, it was contained to only one family, but then it began to spread to others who knew them. Those who became sick suffered from vomiting, diarrhea, and excruciating stomach pain. Doctors were unable to determine the cause of the illness and could do little to help relieve the symptoms. It all started with 37-year-old Molly Young, whose doctors diagnosed with suffering from a bilious attack, which is a variety of symptoms caused by producing too much bile. Oh, no. Really? Uh Uh-huh. It's a thing that can happen. I don't want that to happen. Nobody wants that to happen. But when Molly's husband, 44-year-old Fred Young, also started to suffer the same symptoms, doctors were worried whatever was causing them to be sick was contagious. When Fred's daughter, 22-year-old Winifred, and their son, 14-year-old Graham, also got sick, it all but confirmed this to be true. Fred and Winifred? No. <laughs> you know, dear, I dear portal. May I please be reborn as Fred so I can have a daughter named Winifred? (laughs) Seriously, I didn't think of that until you just said it. It's very cute. Really cute. (laughs) When a few of Graham's... Oh, and you know what? There's an aunt that's going to be introduced, and she is also a Winifred. And so (gasps) he came from a family of Fred and his sister Winifred. I love this. I love this trend. (laughs) Anyone listening whose name is Fred... Take it, take it from here. Run. Seriously, I wonder how many Freds there are in the world so today. So cute. Not nearly enough. When a few of Graham's friends from school came down with the same symptoms, doctors really got concerned. It was odd. The symptoms would come and go, sometimes disappearing for weeks at a time before coming back full force. No treatment seemed to help. Things would continue this way for those in and around the Young family until November 1961, when one morning, young Graham brought his sister a cup of tea. Uh Uh-oh. Winifred said after taking one drink, it was so sour she spit it out and threw the rest away. An hour later, while on the train to work, she began to hallucinate Mm. and had to be helped out of the station. And Graham's 14, right? Yes. What year is this? Eventually, uh, 1961. Got it. Okay. She was eventually taken to the hospital where doctors came to the conclusion that she had somehow been exposed to the poison Atropa belladonna, Mm. a plant also known as deadly nightshade. Mm -hmm. Suspicious of her brother, who had always been a little odd and was fascinated with chemistry, Winifred told her father what happened. Fred confronted Graham, but Graham blamed his sister. He claimed she had been using the family's teacups to mix shampoo, and that must have caused her illness. Mm-hmm. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I mix my shampoo and teacups. I just don't even think about it. I just grab them right <laughs> out of the cabinet and start mixing. <laughs> Next thing you know. Yeah. Dead. Too much bile. <laughs> Belladonna poisoning. <laughs> nightshade shampoo. It's good for curly hair. Take it from yeah, us. I mean, look at this. <laughs> it's pure nightshade. Side of white oleander. (laughs) God. So Fred was not convinced and searched Graham's room, but found nothing incriminating. He still warned his son to be more careful in the future when, quote, messing about with those bloody chemicals. Graham Young was born on September 7th, 1947 in London. His life began tragically when his biological mother died from tuberculosis when Graham was just 14 weeks old. Oh, no. Yeah. Yeah. His father was devastated by his wife's death and sent his children away to live with family. Graham was sent to live with his aunt and uncle, Aunt Winifred. Mm -hmm. His sister was sent to live with her grandparents. Graham spent the first two years of his life with his aunt and uncle and became very close to them. 
When his father remarried in 1950, he decided to reunite his family and took back custody of his children. It's said that Graham showed visible signs of distress after separating from his aunt, who had become a mother to him. Mm -hmm. He never really connected to his new family and became a, quote, rather peculiar child, solitary in his habits. Buddy. Yeah, I mean, that's a rough time to take a kid. Like, two... Yeah, that is, like, some nasty developmental abandonment. Like... Don't do it. No, no, no. Nope. Nope. Especially if he's not, like, stoked. You know, like, okay, maybe he stays with his aunt and visits his dad more often, and we can slowly integrate, but that's not, I'm assuming, how they did it in the 50s. It's probably not how they did it. (laughs) No, they just yanked him right on out of there. Totally. Yep. He also had difficulty making friends with children his age. Mm -hmm. As soon as he was old enough to read, you're going to love this, he would pick nonfiction books up about murder. (laughs) Same, Graham. God, I swear, if anybody had looked into my reading habits, my movie habits, Mm -hmm. anything when I was Graham's age, it was not good. It was very dark. And I was thinking about how young he was. Like, this is the first, like, he started to read and he picked up murder books. And I was like, Mm -hmm. no, Courtney probably would have done that, too. Yes, yes. The second I could get my hand on Stephen King, I was, I I sat in a hallway one day and didn't eat food. Because mm-hmm. I read all of Salem's Lot in one sitting when I was like <laughs> totally. eight. Totally. Yeah. Making me watch like terrible, scary movies at five yes, because you're so into it. Loved it. Mm-hmm. He was also drawn to stories about Dr. Holly Harvey Crippen. Talk about amazing names. Amazing. Holly Harvey Crippen, who was an American homeopathic doctor in the 1880s, who was convicted and hanged for the murder of his wife, Cora. Another amazing name. Mm hmm. Dr. Crippen had used a, quote, calming drug on Cora before killing her, a drug he had bought at his local pharmacy. Uh Uh-oh. He also became fascinated with William Palmer, who was also known as the Prince of Poisoners. Not going, not a good trend. Mm Mm-mm. Palmer, who Charles Dickens called, quote, the greatest villain that ever stood in the old Bailey, was a doctor found guilty of murdering his breath his best friend was strychnine and was suspected of poisoning several others to death including his brother brother mother-in-law and four of his children who all died of quote convulsions before Uh, turning one uh, yeah yeah i mean i don't think i'm gonna go down like an old-timey poison trend uh, like story, but I kind of want to. I was <laughs> going to say, why are you like covering that guy? That guy sucks. I didn't learn about him until I was researching uh. his story. <laughs> <laughs> so Graham was an average student while in school and was only interested in studying chemistry, forensic science, and toxicology. <laughs> like, no big surprise, right? Yep. His access to these subjects were limited, so his dad bought him a chemistry set to play with at home. <laughs> Uh-huh. Fred, he just wants to be supportive. I think that was, is that still a thing? Do kids still get to chemistry sets? I feel like that was like the mm. only toy when we were younger. You know what I yeah, mean? Yeah, you can get like chemistry sets, but it's uh, yeah, like you make slime and you put vol- you know like baking yeah. soda and vinegar for volcanoes. It's really lame. You don't get I, actual chemicals. Like you did we did get actual? Then. I feel like we get actual chemicals, like corrosive. Probably things like actual probably yeah yeah i mean i guess that there are some like there's a crystal growing kit that right but that's just like you have to be more careful with baking maybe. powder or something <laughs> who knows i don't know i haven't reached the age where my children are like mm-hmm. getting into heavy metals and poisonous chemicals <laughs> yet yet <laughs> yep. uh, like, just time, only time will tell. Yeah, I mean, I'm putting in my Amazon list right now for the <laughs> for next year. <laughs> Don't shop at Amazon. That was just an uh-uh. example. <laughs> As a teen, Graham developed an, quote, unhealthy fascination with Adolf Hitler. He began wearing swastikas and telling anyone who would listen that Hitler and the things he stood for were just misunderstood. Graham, don't Graham. Mm, Graham can't help himself. Yeah, Stephen King is one thing. Mm-hmm. Adolf Hitler is a very different thing. Yep, he believed that Hitler was a pretty great guy. <sighs> he also started studying the occult and became familiar with Wiccans and local covens. Mm-hmm. Again, totally cool. 
into it. Yeah, that was, yeah. I went to Boston and got a book on white magic and hate. Right, of course. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if mom still listens. Hey, mom. Um, I'm not a witch. I'm kind of a witch. Totally witchy. Yeah. He even started trying to recruit local kids in his neighborhood to join him in, quote, bizarre occult ceremonies. Yeah. It, it was reported that one of these ceremonies even involved sacrificing a cat. No, Graham. Yeah. God, you keep, like, cabbing me and then losing me. I know. After a few other cats disappeared from the neighborhood around the same time, many believed Graham performed a number of these ceremonies. Yeah. By the age of 13, Graham's knowledge of toxicology allowed him to convince local chemists that he was really 17. He was then able to purchase a dangerous quantity of the poisons antimony, digitalis, and arsenic for, quote, study purposes. No. As well as quantities of the heavy metal thallium. After procuring these items, people around Graham started to get very sick. Yep. So Graham's first victim was thought to be one of his classmates, Christopher Williams, who suffered a prolonged period of vomiting, painful cramps, and headaches. Once Graham realized he wouldn't be able to watch his classmates' symptoms progress, members of his family started to get sick. Oh, no. Mm -hmm. At first, Fred thought maybe Graham was inadvertently poisoning them by being careless with his chemistry set. When he asked Graham if this could be possible, Graham said no. Because Graham was also sick on a few occasions, it never occurred to Fred that his young son could be poisoning his family on purpose. Mm -hmm. It's not clear if Graham was poisoning himself to see what would happen, or was, if he was just being careless. Or maybe right. like trying to throw him off the track. We don't really mm -hmm. know. Totally. So when Winifred was confirmed to have been poisoned, Fred once again asked Graham if he'd done something by accident, and Graham said no. Fred didn't push him any further. After Winifred's hospital stay, it seemed as if Graham's attention turned to his stepmother, Molly. As the months passed, Molly became more frequently ill until Fred came home from work on April 21st, 1961, to find his wife writhing in agony in the back garden while Graham stood over her watching, quote, <clears throat> in fascination. No, no, go, go, get out of there, go, get away. <laughs> I know, it's like such a scene from the bad seed. So much, big time. Molly was rushed to the hospital where she died later that night. Mm. Doctors, mm -mm. yeah, she died. Doctors ruled her cause of death as a prolapsed cervical disc, also known as a herniated disc. Mm? I don't know. <laughs> I don't okay. know. I don't. Okay. I looked it up. I was like, is a herniated disc uh, deadly? Yeah, fatal, and there, nothing came up. I don't, no, I don't know think so. a single thing about that, except that it's every million times I've heard of it, it's not been deadly. Right. I mean, it heard, happens all the time. Yeah. I mean, could it just slice through your spinal cord? I, maybe? I don't, I don't, I don't know. know. Anyway. Yeah. So at Graham's suggestion, Fred decided to have her cremated. <laughs> Fred. Mm -hmm. Fred. Come mm -hmm. on, bud. I know you're probably trying to make up for lost time or mm -hmm. whatever, but... You gotta set some boundaries with this kid. Yes, you do. Big time. At Molly's funeral, a few relatives became violently ill after eating <gasps> and drinking at the wake, but they all survived. You gotta be kidding me. I am not kidding. Oh you. my god. Which is weird because my friend texted me yesterday morning that they were at a <laughs> funeral on Sunday and everybody got food poisoning yes. except for them. When you told me about that, I was like, oh my god, I'm writing that story. <laughs> That's so weird. <laughs> Uh, you better check on her. <laughs> yeah. Make I was sure like, okay. what did they eat? She's like, probably the chicken. Poison. No, it's always, yeah. <laughs> uh, maybe the nightshade that that kid was passing around. <laughs> Seriously. God. So after Molly's death, Fred became sick more often and his illnesses became more severe. I don't know how it's like, I mean, come on, buddy. Come on. It, it's all these cases we cover where deadly kids you know mm. i just i can't i cannot imagine being a parent wrapping no, your mind I around mean, the really. fact that your kid could have had anything to do with this even if they're a little no. quirky seriously i would never believe it it would take your me, kid's like, super years quirky <laughs> no and i love it i think it's so fascinating and interesting and cute and i yeah. love him more for it yeah. yeah by quirky i mean super dark you guys <laughs> super dark <laughs> <laughs> in the best way <laughs> yeah i fully support it yeah 
It got so bad, he was admitted to the hospital where doctors learned he'd been poisoned with antimony, which is a mm-hmm. chemical element that is found in many household products and can be lethal in large doses. If Fred had received any more doses of this poison, he would have died. Mm. It's unknown if Fred confronted his son about the poisoning. If he did, nothing was done to stop him. Soon after, Graham's aunt, who also knew of his fascination of chemistry and poisons, (laughs) became suspicious of her nephew. Right? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, As did his science teacher. Good. The teacher decided to search Graham's desk and discovered several bottles of poison, along with books on famous poisoners in history. (laughs) Leave it to the 60s, man. (laughs) God. (laughs) Now kids have, like, clear backpacks and stuff back then. (laughs) Totally. (laughs) Just full poison poison manuals with a corresponding poison. (laughs) Right, with his, like, poem about how he poisoned his... He loves poisoning his family (laughs) all the time. Yes. For years. (laughs) Right. Boy, oh boy. I know. The teacher spoke to the school's headmaster about his concerns, and they arranged for Graham to be interviewed by a psychiatrist who posed as a career advisor. All right. After meeting with Graham, the psychiatrist was concerned and contacted the police after the boy revealed his extensive knowledge of poisons and toxicology. Hmm. Police brought Graham in for questioning, and he was happy to tell them all about his love for chemistry and how he'd been able to make all sorts of toxic chemicals. He then admitted to poisoning Molly, Fred, and his sister, (laughs) and his classmate, Christopher Williams. Just gave wow. it right there to him. He's like, oh, yeah, totally did that. So this, they, they were just specimens, right? They were just like, right. exactly. in his mind, he's mm-hmm. just studying. He's mm-hmm. just interested and in he's studying. There's a yes. disconnect there of some kind, a serious disconnect. Yes. Yep. And there was one article I read that was like, he definitely seemed to have some autistic um, yeah. tendencies, but not that odd, be, people with autism would go around poisoning people but i think there was a lot of things going on yeah with graham so he's just extremely logical very logical and maybe a little like (laughs) i don't know psychopathic i don't know you know yeah just uh but it doesn't sound like i mean it sounds like he really doesn't understand maybe something in his brain can't differentiate that human life and other like you know what i mean like mm-hmm. that he really was just studying them i yep. don't know yeah and loving hitler. never heard of that before right yeah he right. really loved hitler don't forget that but yeah it's it is interesting it's like let mm-hmm. me see what happens on may 23rd 1962 while graham was on his way home from school he was arrested for poisoning his family he was not charged for molly's death since she'd been cremated there was no proof she had been killed by graham Graham would later explain that Molly had developed a tolerance to the antimony that he'd been giving her, so he switched to thallium the night before her death to speed up the process. He was pleased and pleasantly surprised by how quickly the thallium did its horrible job on Molly's body. Graham pleaded guilty to three charges of poisoning. He did not plead guilty to poisoning Molly and was convicted of, quote, malicious administration of a a noxious thing to inflict grievous bodily harm. During the sentencing hearing, psychiatrist Dr. Christopher Fish testified that Graham had a, quote, psychopathic disorder rather than a mental illness and had failed, quote, to develop a normal moral sense. He felt it was extremely likely that Graham would reoffend and told the judge about a conversation he had with Graham who said, quote, I am missing my antimony. I miss the power it gives me. Oh, yeah, yo, yeah. Mm. Don't give him any access to that at the very right. minimum. <laughs> right. So he recommended Graham be committed to Broadmoor Hospital, and the judge agreed. Mm. He sentenced Graham to be detained under Section 60 of the Mental Health Act, and he was to be sent to Broadmoor Hospital for a minimum of 15 years. Mm-hmm. To be released, Graham would need the approval of the Home Secretary. So at 14, he was the youngest prisoner to be sent to Broadmoor since 1885. Wow. Just a little side note, the very youngest prisoner was 10 when he was put into Broadmoor. And he actually died there shortly before Graham was admitted. He spent his whole life there. 
Yikes. It's a very famous hospital. Yeah, I've yeah. definitely heard of it before. Yes. Yep. So you might think the story ends there. That Graham nope. learned his lesson, did his time, and then went on to be a productive member of society. But that's not how this works, right? Nope. The truth is, he was a very bad seed. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Within a few weeks of his incarceration, a fellow inmate, John Bedridge, died from cyanide poisoning. You are kidding me. Nope. Before almonds? John. How did he get it? No, this right? like, tastes like almonds. What's it in? Well, cherry. T- cherry pits. I think you, that's arsenic. Anyway, I'll anyway. tell you where he, he Okay, I can't his. wait. Okay. <laughs> So before John's death, Graham had eagerly told hospital staff that he could extract cyanide leaves from the laurel bushes that were everywhere on the hospital grounds. (laughs) They just put him right in his little play amusement park. Yes, and poison compound. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, no. They had no proof that he'd killed John and didn't really believe that he could make his own cyanide, so they ruled that John had died by suicide. Mm-hmm. Like, how did John get the cyanide? I don't know. I don't know. Graham continued his studies on toxicology, but quickly learned to keep his fascination to himself after being told he would be released sooner if he didn't talk about poison anymore. <laughs> this is his doctors were like, stop talking about it. If you want to get out of here, you're going to have to ixnay the poison pay, buddy. (laughs) Exactly. What the fuck? So as the months passed, staff and inmates' drinks were found to be... As the months passed, staff and inmates' drinks were found to have been tampered with. An abrasive sodium compound called, quote, sugar soap, which is used for preparing walls for paint, was found inside a tea urn that was being set out for staff and inmates to drink from. (laughs) If it hadn't been caught quickly, it could have caused a mass poisoning. Oh, my God. When he wasn't busy trying to hurt people, Graham spent his free time reading The Rise and Fall of the Third Reich mm-hmm. and, the scourge of the squa- so- and The Scourge of the Swastika. At one point, he grew a toothbrush mustache and took to mimicking the speeches of Hitler. Wow, dude. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. He's yep, in a his poison class compound. of his own. He is in a class of his own. I've never heard of anyone like him. Yeah, it's really interesting. Super interesting. So Graham first applied for release from Broadmoor in 1965, three years after he was put in prison. Mm-hmm. He applied for release. His father, Fred, and Aunt Winifred attended the tribunal and told the board that if Graham was released, none of his relatives would be willing to house him. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. Who could blame him? Sound plan. Yep. Right. Set those boundaries. Yep. Fred also told the panel that his son should, quote, never be released. Graham's application was rejected, but just a few years later, Graham's manipulation of his doctors seemed to work. In June of 1970, hospital staff recommended that he be released because he had been cured. Oh. Yeah. Good. He, uh, great. He was totally fine. Nobody has been poisoned in mass in this hospital in three weeks. Right, it's done. Get yeah, it's not out of here. Talked about poison for like three and a half days. So we're good. We did it, you guys. <laughs> they were like, "Please, dude, please. We are sick of you poisoning us. Will you please just stop talking about it, Seriously. so we can release you because I'm I cannot get poisoned again. <laughs> yeah, I'm at my like limit with getting point. poisoned by you, George Bush style, like Mission Impossible banners behind." Them, seriously. Like, <laughs> seriously. Did I just say Mission Impossible? <laughs> yes, you did. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mission yep. complete? What did that banner say? <laughs> done. Mission done skis. <laughs> <laughs> did said Mission done skis. Damn it. Damn it. Anyway. So after hearing the news, Graham excitedly told a psychiatric nurse that he, uh, after learning the, the news that he'd been cured. He right. excitedly told a psychiatric nurse that he intended to kill one person for every year he'd been in Broadmoor. Uh, well, what? Yeah. And she was like, yeah, cured. We'll just keep that between you and me. Get out of here. Because <laughs> I'm also was... sick up to here of getting poisoned by you all the time. <laughs> right. You're just your Hitler skits are really getting on my nerves. God. The comment was recorded in his file, but somehow this information didn't seem to make it to the people who decided to release him. 
One of the prison psychiatrists wrote to the home secretary to recommend his release, saying that Graham, quote, is no longer obsessed with poisons, violence, and mischief. <laughs> and he no <laughs> and he is no longer a danger to others. After only eight years in prison, Graham was released in February of 1971 at only 23 years old. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yep. Prime first, poison and age, just <laughs> like so many poison and years ahead of him. I mean, so many. He's got energy. He's yes. got. He can get very little sleep, so he can do have more poisoning hours in the day. Yes. Yes. Damn it. He first moved in with his sister and her husband. It was reported that Winifred was more forgiving of Graham than her, their father, who initially wanted nothing to do with his son. <sighs> She was concerned by his fixation with the past and said he took great delight in visiting the scenes of his crimes, thriving on the reaction of his old neighbors when they recognized who he was. Buddy, God. Mm -hmm. Within the first few weeks of being released from the hospital, he managed to acquire two different poisonous chemicals from a chemist in London. Graham started working as an assistant storekeeper at John Hadland Laboratories. (laughs) No background checks in that town. Uh, Nope. The company manufactured thallium bromide infrared lenses, which were used in military equipment. His new co-workers found him unpredictable. Quote, he could be surly and kept to himself, but on other days he was more cheery. Probably the poisoning days. Yeah, that put him in a great old mood. During breaks, he usually sat alone reading. Thallium was not kept at the lab, so Graham had to continue to get his poison from the chemist. <laughs> I was going to say, he's just got like a fire hose of thallium at his disposal. Right. Hose and oh. straight into his back of his poison. Backpack. Poison. Now like a tanker. Oh. Picture him just like rolling up those tankers. <laughs> like. Well, I just imagine his disappointment when he gets to the lab and he's like, oh, they yeah. don't have it here. Damn right. it. Right. Mm-hmm. That's the whole point. Yeah. Can I get a transfer, please? Right. So his new employers were aware of his Broadmoor stay. Graham told them that he had suffered a nervous breakdown following the death of his mother in a car accident, but he never mentioned his history as a poisoner. <laughs> I'm smart. Right. That's, that's good. When I'm giving people career advice. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Ixnay on the oysen pay, bud. Hey, right. Can you mm-hmm. uh, check my resume? Uh, yeah, no, 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 no. Yeah, Don't see this here, this out. thing right here at the top of Bo. Mm-hmm. He spent five years in Broadmoor for killing half your family of poison. Yeah, it doesn't. You know, if it it. comes up in the interview, you can address it, but you shouldn't just come out of the gate with that. So no one was concerned when Graham started making the coffee and tea for the staff every day. Each person (sighs) had their own mugs they would use, and it was part of Graham's job to bring them their coffee in the morning. When his boss, 59-year-old Bob Eggle, began to experience severe cramps and dizziness, he believed he'd caught a virus known as the, quote, Bovingdon bug which had recently afflicted a number of school children and had been in the news. Mm. Bob took several days off work and went back after making a full recovery. The day he returned, Graham put a lethal dose of thallium in Bob's afternoon tea and his condition deteriorated rapidly. He complained of intense back pain and numbness in his fingers and feet. He was rushed to the hospital. By the time he got there, he was paralyzed. Oh, God. Yeah. No. Fucking awful. Awful. Witnesses say Graham showed a strong concern for Bob, repeatedly contacting the hospital for updates on his progress. Poor Bob suffered terribly before he died on July 7th, 1971. His cause of death was recorded as pneumonia. (laughs) Ow. How? I know it was a long time ago. I know it was before the internet, but how? And this is the same, same town, right? He didn't go to mm-hmm. a new town? Oh, uh, I Ish? think it was. It's kind I think of close. Not, yeah, close, but not like the exact same town, but close enough. Yeah. yeah. Wild. So after Bob's death, Graham would target different co workers in the office depending on his mood. In a diary that was later found, Graham wrote that he poisoned one of his co-workers when she annoyed him, writing, quote, Di irritated me yesterday, so I packed her off home with an attack of the sickness. I only <sighs> gave her something to shake her up. I now regret that I didn't give her a larger dose, capable of laying her up for a few days. 
What the f- uh, What? No. Nope. Often the beverages he would serve the poison in were too strong or sweet for the victim's liking, which wound up saving many lives. Many of Graham's victims spent days in the hospital with numbness in their extremities, breathing difficulties, and chest pains. One victim said their skin was so tender while in the hospital that even the weight of the bed sheets was excruciating. Oh my god. Many victims lost all of their hair, and many were left completely impotent. Wow. Wow. So Graham's last known victim was 56-year-old Fred Biggs. Graham first poisoned Fred with antimony, causing the Bovington bug symptoms. When Fred returned to work after being out sick on October 30th, Graham gave Biggs three doses of thallium in his tea. Fred quickly began having chest pains and trouble walking. He was admitted to three different hospitals where doctors could not find the cause of his symptoms. Fred's central nervous system deteriorated so badly that he could not speak and had trouble breathing. His skin also began to peel off. No, 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 no. Sorry, I know. Bud, yow. Awful. Awful. While he was in the hospital, Graham showed concern for Fred's condition, constantly calling Fred's wife and the hospital directly to ask how he was doing. After suffering, like, beyond suffering, for nearly three weeks. Jesus. Fred Biggs died on November 19th, 1971. Unbelievable. No. I I just can't get over the fact that this kid was let out and that nobody was keeping an eye on him. Seriously. No, like, follow-ups. Hey, where'd you get a job, buddy? Oh, (laughs) chemical factory. Yeah. What do you do for them? Make them their tea. (laughs) No. No, it's awful. After Fred's death, and as more of their employees were out sick, the, imag- the management at Hadland Laboratories became terribly concerned that something at the lab was causing the illness. I mean, right? I would say the first like two people that got sick, right? Then you're like, okay, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So something is happening here. We need to take care of our lab yep. that does lab stuff, right? <laughs> no. I mean, I'm no lab manager, but. <laughs> <laughs> you are the one who hired him despite the fact that he had <laughs> poisoner true. with of chemicals on there with chemicals <laughs> yeah. well he really poisoner likes chemistry. Comma chemicals right yeah. <laughs> so various sources were considered including water contamination radioactive fallout and possible chemical leakage at the lab but no evidence of anything was uncovered that would lead to what was making everyone so sick While the investigation was ongoing, some of Graham's co-workers were becoming suspicious of him. He was the only one of the workers who never became sick. Yep. One co-worker went to her employer and suggested maybe Graham was the carrier of the virus, sort of like Typhoid Mary had been. Mm -hmm. And another co-worker told management about Graham's unhealthy interest in poison. (laughs) Sorry, it's not funny. It's not, but it's, but it's just, like, come on. He has so an outrageous. unhealthy interest in poison. So much so that people notice it and have to take it to upper management. It's so absurd. Yeah. When the firm's medical officer told staff that he had ruled out heavy metal, heavy metal poisoning as a possible cause, Graham began to argue heatedly with him. Graham insisted that the symptoms displayed by victims pointed to heavy metal poisoning. Mm-hmm. Graham's behavior puzzled the doctor, so he questioned Graham more about his knowledge after the meeting ended. Graham was happy to share his extensive knowledge of poisons and toxicology with the doctor, who then took this information to John Hadland, who owned the lab. Good. Hadland then called police. Good. Let's wrap yes. this guy out of uh, there. Seriously. The investigating officers noticed that the onset of the Bovington bug coincided with Graham's arrival at the company, and a background check revealed Graham's previous convictions. Oh, that how long was, how, do you know how long he worked there? I don't know how long. Let me see. I'd I could be very out, curious. Yeah. You know, was I, it I, like I mean, three weeks? Was it two years? <laughs> like, what's the timeline yeah, here? Let me see if I can... Must have been a a while. Oh, well, so he was, 
Um, he was convicted of all of this in 72, so it wasn't very long. Mm-hmm. It was like a year Man. between getting out and poisoning all of these people and then getting rearrested. Wild. Yep. So Graham was brought in for questioning and denied any wrongdoing. As he was busy at the station, officers were searching his bed sit. There they found a large stash of bottles containing five different poisons, including <laughs> <laughs> including 434 milligrams of thallium and 32.33 grams of antimony, which is Guys, more than 200 times the lethal, lethal dose. Keep your poison in a, a remote location <laughs> put it someplace else <laughs> put it in a box in the yard at the very Seriously. least Seriously, or don't i mean please don't please no. leave it right under your bed right yes. and right where the police can find it right what wtf that is so clearly his brain right his mm-hmm. that crazy disconnect in his mind where either he doesn't know he doesn't care a combination of both like this is just what he does and he's just going to keep doing it and talking right. about it and and admitting to it and not trying to cover it up really at all right and he's 23 and he yep. got to have fun poisoning people went to the hospital where he could poison people mm-hmm. got released where he could poison more people it's like mm-hmm. he just doesn't he's like whatever i'm just going to keep poisoning people because yeah. it's just the only thing i want to do and i can do it wherever i go and so i'm just going to get the stockpile of poison and do my damnedest until I get caught. And then I'm going to go to prison and keep, keep going. You know, so it's like, you're how to do it in there too. Right. Wow. Yeah. If you love what you do, you can never work a day in your life. So what they say, God, (laughs) so true. They also found his room covered in swastikas and pictures of Hitler Authorities hit the evidence jackpot when they found a detailed diary that Graham kept, noting the doses of poison he had administered, their effects, and whether he was going to allow his victims to live or die. Oh, fuck this guy. Yeah. So when officers told Graham what they had found, he happily answered their questions and even helped them decipher parts of his journal that were hard to understand. He admitted to poisoning five of his co-workers and said he used different poisons to throw off the doctors. He hmm. also bragged about committing the, quote, perfect murder by killing his stepmother, Molly, and spent 20 minutes explaining the, the effects that thallium has on the human body. Mm-hmm. Graham also told police he poisoned a man who was staying at the same hostel as Graham was after he was released from Broadmoor. The two had been drinking buddies Graham even considered him a friend. He didn't kill him, but the man became terribly ill and was said to have suffered permanent physical damage from the poison. It's also believed that another man he befriended experienced such agony from being poisoned that he took his own life, Oof. although no connection to Graham was established at the time. Fuck this guy. When asked why he had poisoned people who were friends and colleagues, Graham responded, quote, I suppose I had ceased to see them as people. At least a part of me had. They were simply guinea pigs. Yep. That sums it right up. Yep, sure does. So Graham was charged with two counts of murder, two counts of attempted murder, four counts of administering poison with the intent to injure, and four alternative counts of administering poison with the intent to cause grievous bodily harm. He pleaded not guilty and had a difficult time finding a barrister willing to represent him. (laughs) Who can blame them? (laughs) Leading up to his trial, Graham retracted his confession and it was ruled the jury could not know of Graham's previous convictions. Oh, come on. God, how, how, how did they get away with that? That's just absolutely mind boggling. This whole thing. Yes, it really is. The evidence against him was damning, including autopsy reports that far that found large amounts of thallium in Fred Biggs' his eternal organs, and they even found thallium in the cremated remains of Bob Eggle. On June 29, 1972, the jury spent one hour and 38 minutes deliberating before finding him guilty on almost all counts. Yeah, big surprise. They're like, guys, if we just wrap this up, we can get happy hour. This guy <laughs> clearly did it. Fuck this guy. Yes. <laughs> So after being found guilty, Graham requested to go to a conventional prison rather than return to Broadmoor. He was then sentenced to life in prison, and his request was granted. Uh 
His stay at the conventional prison was short-lived before he was moved to Ashworth Hospital. Because the guy probably needs to be in a hospital. Yeah, he's very nutsy. Yeah. There, he had to be moved frequently to different rooms because he was constantly finding ways to make poisons from various household products. Unbelievable. Yes. Graham also managed to befriend Moore's murderer, Ian Brady. Uh, uh, no. Yes. Oh, match made in hell. Hell. Ew. Yes. Is no. it, it's, it's Ian, right? Not Ian. Fuck that Ian guy? Brady? I don't care. I don't know. Anyway. Uh, yeah. I-A-N. <laughs> <laughs> I, I am I a on, bad guy. I on. I exactly. <laughs> I on a bad guy. <laughs> uh, they shared a cell and also their love of Nazis. <laughs> Graham yep. Young would spend the rest of his life in prison before dying alone in his cell on the evening of August 1st, 1990, one month before his 43rd birthday. Wow. His cause of death was listed as myocardial infraction, but because he had never suffered from heart disease, people speculated he either died from suicide or was murdered by other inmates or prison staff who did not feel safe having him around. Yep. Graham's case spurred changes in the British judicial system, including more safeguards being introduced during the parole process of mentally ill offenders. Quote, no patient at a special hospital was to be discharged without two concurring recommendations from psychiatrists. Mm-hmm. <laughs> kind of rolling my eyes. Uh, and the mm-hmm. supervision of a released patient was also improved. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> they also announced an inquiry to review the management of mentally ill offenders and criminal justice system, which led to the committee's recommendations in 1975. Um, which resulted in the expansion in forensic mental health services with the development of regional, which is now referred to as medium secure units in most of the health regions in England and Wales. Mm-hmm. So they, they upped their resources mm-hmm. and hospitals for mental People health. Who, yes. Good. Great. Yes. Um, so prior to that, there had only been the high security hospitals of Broadmoor, Rampton and Ashworth. Mm hmm. So Graham left a chilling legacy after a movie was made in 1995 based loosely on Graham's life titled The Young Poisoner's Handbook. Uh, In November 2005, a 16-year-old Japanese schoolgirl was arrested for poisoning her mother with thallium. Mm -mm. She claimed to be fascinated by Graham, having seen the 1995 film and kept an online blog similar to Graham's diary recording dosages and reactions. Nope, I roll. No, don't mm-hmm. do it. Not cool, not sexy. Don't do it. Nope. So during his trial, Graham expressed his hope that he his waxwork would appear in Madame Tussauds' Chamber of Horrors. He later got his wish, and his likeness appeared in the exhibit near that of his boyhood hero, Dr. Grippen. No. Yeah. No. There you go, guys. Oh, man. How many That's... people did he kill total he killed f- four wow three Ugh, and then tortured. To kill. yeah i mean countless he, others so his two co-workers and molly mm-hmm. and it doesn't matter that's plenty yeah. and then tens hundreds of other people right got. i think he mo- i mean not mostly because that's two three is too many but um he mostly just maimed them made them terribly ill yeah, or impotent, or mm-hmm. God knows. God knows what sort of horrible things are still affecting those people to this day. Right. Wow. Wow. What do you guys think? What do you think is going on in that one? Yeah. Just, I don't know. We had somebody write uh, to us about my love of saying the words sociopath and narcissist. And sent some super interesting articles about how, like, we just don't really know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but I think, you know, the, the I read, you know, the articles they sent and read a book that they sent. And I think the bottom line is that as hard as we try to figure each other out, you can't do it, right? No. Like, there are so many factors. It's so nuanced. And when one person presents like this, another person presents like this, and you know, this person that wrote to us said, you know, they're autistic and they get, 
misdiagnosed or, or called a psychopath because, you know, they have a flat affect or whatever the mm-hmm. reason may be. So I need to stop doing, like, just trying to figure out, but I just want to know, mm-hmm. like, what is that? What is going on with him? You know, to yeah. to lack so much empathy that people just become specimen. Like, they just, he's just doing experiments on everybody. Yep. It doesn't matter who you are, family, friends, coworkers. You're, those are even better. You're even more fair mm-hmm. game because he can keep an eye on you. Yeah. yeah. As soon as he realized he couldn't watch every minute of the process, he was like, okay, people that are closest to me. Unreal. Uh, well, yeah. I'm very sorry for his victims. No. And very sorry for the people who have had to live with the consequences. Ugh. That sucks. No, boy, no. Nope. What do you guys think? Thanks for listening. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>